Om Stapakaya Chadarmasya Sarva Dharma Swarupine Avatara Varishtaya Rama Krishna Yate Namaha. I bow down to Rama Krishna, <clears throat> the embodiment of all dharmas, <sighs> the truest of all avatars. I bow down again and again. Now tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to make a little departure from the, the usual. Um, sometimes I like to supplement the uh, Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna with some other um, books that were written uh, about him um, because primarily the English because the English translation by Swami Nikilananda, which is a monumental work um, and quite wonderful, unfortunately um, rather lacks the feeling tone that I think that the Bengali language generally, uh, conveys, but and other authors have done somewhat better at that. And so um, tonight I was going to take one chapter from The Face of Silence by Dhan Gopal Mukherjee, who um, published this book in 1926 originally. Um, it is fundamentally uh, information that he gleaned from the monks at Belur, who were direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. And he was so enthralled with it that he, he, produced, um, he produced this book. Now, what's really interesting about this, there's a number of different things. First of all, the dedication page, um, <clears throat> dedicated to those who pointed me this path, Josephine McLeod. Jadu Gopal Mukhopadhyaya, Alice Sprague, and Mrs. Sumner Hunt. Three Western women and one Indian man. I mean, I thought that was rather interesting. The other thing is the title itself, The Face of Silence. You see, in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, translated, well, it, it, M's original, actually, he was just, Swami Nikilananda was translating M's original. There are many, many places where it says uh, Ramakrishna went into samadhi for a long time. And then it continues with the narrative, okay? Um, so that you get the impression that Ramakrishna spent most of his time talking, which was not the case. So th this, this book points out the fact that Ramakrishna was mostly silent m most of the time, and that his face was what people who saw him connected with, whether or not he was speaking. Okay, so just this, this I don't know, I mean, he may describe it in here somewhere, I didn't reread the whole book, but it, it just kind of the luminosity or the, the um, attractiveness of this face of Ramakrishna for, you know, many people. So, um, the, the, the title itself is fantastic, and also the fact that <clears throat> it was taken <clears throat> from the direct disciples. Now, the chapter that I want to uh, concentrate on tonight is called Description of the Indescribable. And it's fundamentally a, uh, taken from interviews with Swami Turiyananda. And so, uh, other than changing the mode of address that's written in here, I'm going to read it just as as it uh, as it stands. And then, if we complete that, <clears throat> and if people want to discuss anything in particular, we can do we can do that. And then um, uh, we'll I'll close with two or three paragraphs from the the very tail end. Okay. So description of the indescribable. The reader may ask, what did Ramakrishna mean by seeing God? What does samadhi mean? 
What are the stages of development through which one attains the state of samadhi? During my course of gathering the Ramakrishna legends, it became more and more necessary to learn of the nature of the spiritual experience that held his disciples to his side. Why is it that such strong, healthy young persons never wearied of him? What made them stay near him with so much devotion? What wonders did he show them? How come, how came they to be blind to the attractions of this world? Did Ramakrishna offer them a greater and deeper attraction? All these questions I put before Swami Turiyananda in Banaras. He said in answer, quote, Ramakrishna showed us the face of the eternal. After that, we stayed on with him hoping that through his compassion and by training, we would see him again. Once a disciple, always a disciple. Think of the possibility of being thrown into samadhi, a thing for which men toil for a hundred incarnations, by one single touch of his finger or toe. How could we leave his side, we who were so greedy like all youths, to taste bliss absolute again and again? He enabled us to stare into the eyes of God at least once. That naturally blinded us to this world. We see nothing here, and whatever we do see is filled with the brimming light of tut, that. No matter what we see or feel, it says, you are he, you are he, tatvam asi. That is what Ramakrishna did to us. After such an event, we were tethered to him as the bird is to the sky. It may go very far in many directions, yet it will remain under the many branched sky." Unquote. It is a well-known fact that his chelas often pressed Ramakrishna to describe the indescribable. But even he maintained, quote, God consciousness cannot be explained through words. Only experience, not phrases, can reveal to you the full magnitude of the invisible, unquote. But in spite of that, the devoted group of disciples urged him to speak particularly of his own experience of samadhi, oneness, with the absolute, Brahman. Ramakrishna asked to be excused. Quote, I cannot see why I should explain it to you, whom I have trained and helped to attain that experience. If it can be put into words, why do you not do it? But, my lord, the disciples said, we cannot live in it as long as you can. You who have stayed in samadhi six, seven days at a time are the one to explain it. In the presence of silence, how dare we speak? But Ramakrishna only smiled at their bare-faced compliment. Then a very keen-witted young man tried another way of making him speak. But my lord, how do we know that every one of us attains the same experience when our paths are different. For instance, when I meditate and quicken all my being with the thought of oneness, my spiritual energy does not act the same way as that of another. Ah, that is the comparison of the way men's intuition acts, replies, replied the master. That is easy to describe. Here, meaning himself, I experimented on all the ways in order to verify them, but no matter how my spiritual energy acted, at the end it rose to the seventh valley, and there I beheld dot, dot, dot. That instant, Ramakrishna passed into samadhi. His breathing stopped, his heart ceased working, and his pulse beat no more. Were it not for the even temperature of his body, there was no way of distinguishing him from a corpse. Of course, there was nothing alarming about it. His apostles had seen him in that state very often, days at a time. At last, when he came out of samadhi, he resumed his discourse. Oh, my sons, I try to explain it to you, but the experience is so great, words cannot render it. You must plunge yourself into the waters of that experience for there is no other way of fathoming it. Your mind and intellect, uh, swift though they are, cannot overtake the lightning steed of God's consciousness, of God consciousness. 
those two only raise the dust of words in which they get lost. But my Lord, you said that the ways in which the soul sight, translation of Dharma eye, rises in a man, you can explain. Yes, agreed Ramakrishna. Though what the Dharma eye sees is indescribable, yet the paths it travels are within the reach of words. And though the end is the same, yet the ways of reaching it are diverse. The rishis of old have enumerated at least five different ways that the soul energy of man rises to God when they kindle themselves with prayers and meditation. For instance, sometimes a man's soul power moves, as the rishis say, like the hop, hop, hop of a toad. Sometimes it runs as a snake glides up a hillside in flashes and curves. Then there is still another way. Each cell of your body and every pulse of your heart beat slowly. The regularity of the rhythm with which your intuitions catch fire is slow and inevitable as the march of a row of ants from one food center to another. The fourth way is the way of a bird or birds. You know how birds fly off one tree and move in the air as though they were wandering aimlessly. Yet they alight on a distant tree that has been in their mind all the while. Similarly, rises and alights on the divine, your soul energy when thoroughly quickened by persistent devotion. Each atom of your being seems to fly up on the wings of all piercing light. It may wander about aimlessly at first, but if you keep on meditating and praying, those wings will bring you to the house of oneness. The fifth way is quite different from the others. The sages have called it the way of monkeys. You can sometimes see monkeys sitting still like a rock. Then suddenly they start leaping and bounding and they do not stop until they have reached their destination, somebody's mango garden. So acts your spiritual sight. You sit still and meditate day after day, yet nothing happens. But you keep on thinking of oneness with your body, heart, mind, and soul. Let not even a particle of you flag. Concentrate hard till, in the course of two or three years, suddenly your insight leaps from plane to plane, scaling the steepest precipices with the ease of a hawk, then plunges into Advaita, oneness with infinite intelligence. Now Ramakrishna closed his eyes and sat still. Slowly he passed into samadhi. Again, his listeners had to wait a long time. It may sound incredible, but the patience with which they waited on their master surpasses all measurement. On this occasion, nearly an hour had passed when Ramakrishna came out of samadhi and resumed his discourse. Next to the difference of the ways a soul climbs to oneness, you must watch for the planes of consciousness that you must traverse. No matter whose meditation, whether of Lord Buddha or of a common man, it must take him across six different valleys, planes of consciousness, in order to reach the seventh, the last. Whether your soul's intuition hops like a toad or flies like a bird, it must behold the seven valleys. Is the experience of each one of those valleys the same, no matter how a soul reaches it? Asked one of the disciples. Yes, answered the master, it is identically the same. The same disciple asked him further, and did you commence your meditation the same way every time? Was your method at all different from what we do? Ramakrishna. There is no difference at all between them. I sat still, as my guru advised me, and purified my thoughts and feelings of all the dross of separation. In my mind, in my heart, in my soul, in every cell of my body, I sought his presence. I knew that I was not separate from him. He was in me. Hence, I quickened every bit of myself to elicit the hidden self. Come forth, 
O thou sword of immortality, from this thy scabbard. Thus I prayed, days, weeks, and months. And at last my insight hopped, hop, hop, dot, dot, dot. It leaped over the embankment of this world into the waters of the first of the seven valleys. A light, utterly unknown, like another sun, shone upon what I perceived. All the things of this earth that I looked upon were the vesture of beauty, wore the vesture of beauty. Everywhere I glanced, beyond and around, beauty and spirituality leaped out of matter like tigers from dark dens. Now I was aware that this was the home of the senses. The sight of so much wonder filled me with terrible appetites. Possess, possess, they cried. I was seized with an overpowering desire to taste and own all the beauty that lay about me. Just at that moment, another cry broke out in me. Beware, beware of the sinister temptation of this valley. No so sooner heard than done, I set out to quicken my meditation. I meditated harder and prayed more intensely for release from the first valley. At the end of some months, my prayers were answered. The world of the senses tempted me no more. Slowly the first valley fell from my consciousness as the skeleton of its prey falls from the eagle's talons. This would be comparable um, to um, the temptations of Buddha, probably, you know, uh, the first valley. Mara <clears throat> tempted the Buddha and uh, I think it's very similar to this kind of a thing where he f had to come to the realization that, no, you know, I don't go there. Now that Ramakrishna had taken the best out of it, he left the first valley behind. I had entered the second valley. Here I was not obsessed with the clawing material beauty of what I saw. The light in which the world appeared now was more refined, more subtle, and soothing. I felt happy here. Fragments of beautiful colors, shapes, and sounds haunted and sweetened my hours in this valley. I thought of relaxing my meditation and staying here. Just then, I was tempted to create life, quote, things of sex. For in the sublime light of the second valley, sex wears the appearance, appearance of beatitude and power. But no matter how it appears, the soul must resist its temptation. I set out to free my consciousness from the besetting beauty of sex. I leaped more, I heaped more fuel of devotion on the altar of God quest. The fire of illumination burnt very low at first but gradually it became brighter. And in a few more days, lo, it burnt like daggers of light. And in those biting flames, the second valley burnt into cinders. Neither it nor its temptations fretted me further. Thus, I reached the third stage. In this valley, I found that the sense of power that I had experienced before in the second had increased a hundredfold. Now I felt that I could take the sun between the palms of my hands and crush it into a handful of burning dust. Do you recall that one, one quote from Swami Vivekananda, we shall crush the stars, we are the servants of Ramakrishna. Perhaps he's coming off of this kind of a description that the master said which wasn't uh, reported as such in uh, M's gospel. <clears throat> I'll repeat this last sentence. Now I felt that I could take the sun between the palms of my hands and crush it into a handful of burning dust. This sense of power must be resisted. It is nothing but a test of one's character. There is no temptation viler than the sense of power. 
The instant I had perceived the danger that beset me, I quickened my meditation to the utmost. It had to be more powerful than the power that I had to resist. I prayed, oh, how I prayed, to be free of my sense of power. Like the fangs of a viper, it held me. But my soul would not yield to it. I rose on the wings of meditation, higher and higher, till height had no meaning for me. At that moment, the serpent opened its mouth and fell from my side. Now, like an elephant hurtling through a fence, I plunged on the valley of the light of God's heart, translated from Hridaya Jyoti. As if my heart had become a torch lit by the flame from his, light fell from my soul over everything. Pebbles and stars all sang with equal radiance a song of the ineffable. In this fourth valley, I felt well nigh secure from every temptation, yet I kept a strict watch on myself. Though I was a chalice of light, yet I felt suspicious of temptation. That feeling served me as a warning. I decided not to tarry here. Thus followed another long period of fasting, prayer, and meditation. Fortunately, this time I did not have to wait so very long. The light in my heart expanded. It flung a vast circle like a net of suns around and beyond. And lo, I had reached the next valley, the realm of utterance. My thoughts and feelings, every pulse in each cell of me was illumined. Through my throat and lips poured words of wonder and benediction. I praised the Lord all the time. Save of him, I could not bear to speak. And if anyone spoke of possessions and pleasures, their words smote me like rods. It got to be so that if any of my relatives came to consult me on family matters, I used to run away and hide myself in the woods of Panchavati. Relations or friends who sought to own me appeared to me as a deep well dragging me down. I feared to be suffocated in the water way below in the dark earth. I felt as though dr drowning in their presence. <clears throat> Only by leaving them could I find peace. In one word, this valley is not full of tolerance and love for all. One must transcend it. That is why I flung myself into deeper and steeper meditations yet there was no peace nor pleasure for me. Either find him face to face or take my life, I counseled myself. As a tiger crouches in order to leap, so did I. I prayed, I waited, I watched. I would not linger in the valley of utterance. I must not give in to merely praising God. I must see him. So. I sat with prayers. Suddenly, I perceived something ahead. That instant, I leaped. In a trice, I was in the sixth, the Valley of Turia. Here, I was close to my beloved. I could see and feel him in the next chamber. Only a thin, transparent veil separated the soul from the self. At last, I knew that I was in a room in the house of oneness. From the sixth valley, it, it is not difficult to pass on to the seventh. There, no word can enter, nor the chatter of human thought. Only your soul, clad in silence, can lift the veil that separates him from your embrace. A long silence fell after Ramakrishna had finished speaking. But instead of meditating the rest of the day on what the master had said, one of the young men questioned, people say that you are ignorant, my lord, and how do you know all that the sages of the past wrote? 
for what you have told us lies buried in tomes of metaphysics. I am told you're an ignorant man. I guess that means illiterate. <clears throat> Ramakrishna answered in a way quite different from his usual answer. I never studied profound books, but I have heard scholars discuss them. Having heard and gathering what rang true for my own needs, I made a garland of them and put them around my neck. Then I flung every inch of it at the feet of God saying, mother, take all your erudite tomes and laws. All I want is love of thee. Just at that moment, someone raised a very significant question. My Lord, all that you have told us is pleasing to the soul and satisfying to the heart. But my wayward mind wishes to know this. He who starts his meditation with de desire of oneness has to do so by saying, feel, feeling, and realizing, I am he, I am he. But what about those who start the opposite way saying, thou art not me, yet I seek thee. What happens to them, my Lord? Do they too cross those valleys and become one with him? Or do they remain separate from him forever? Sri Ramakrishna answered without any pause or hesitation. That is about ultimate matters, but there is no difference. Whether you call him thou or call him I am he, men that realize him through thou have a very lovely relationship with him. It is very much like that of an old trusted servant with his master. As they both grow old, the master leans and depends on his friend, the servant, more and more. Towards the end of his life, the master consults his pearl of a servant regarding every serious matter that he wishes to undertake. One day, deeply pleased with his servitor's devotion, the master takes him by the hand, then seats him on his own august seat. The servant is embarrassed and in his excitement says, what are you doing, my lord? But the master holds him on the throne next to himself, saying, You are the same as I, my beloved. So, though we worship God as one apart, yet if we worship him with sincerity and consecration, he will someday very suddenly make us one with himself. That is samadhi. Unquote. <clears throat> there is a legend that at one time, some friends of Ramakrishna urged him to explain samadhi. They said, if you say something about it, you prove everything. Give us a definition of samadhi, and that will give us a definition of God. But the wary holy one replied, and if I give you a definition of God, what will you do with it? Oh, I know what you will eventually do. You will make a creed of it in order to found a new religion in my name. I did not come to earth to start another cult. Oh, no. However, it is reported that on another occasion, Ramakrishna incidentally, incidentally defined God. Some visitors asked him, will you please resolve what seems to us a contradiction? People say that you have attained identity. You are he, yet you go about giving all the credit to the Divine Mother. You never say, I. You speak of God, Mother, She, Thou. If you are, I am he, why do you call God Thou? The master answered, that is the ultimate matter of conduct. I have seen him, embraced him and embraced him. I was infinite existence, absolute intelligence, and bliss. But I could not stay in that unconditioned state and yet be here in the conditioned. There, there is no limit. Each and all are one infinite existence, unconditioned, indescribable. You cannot use words about it. No matter what you say becomes finite. 
Naturally, you say, thou, she, mother. Take the seven scales of music. Suppose you go on mounting, do, re, mi. Will you reach the highest note? Till you reach the highest note, what will you do next? You will come to do. Each man, after he has reached silence, the highest pitch, the moment he opens his mouth, he utters do, and do is God. Of course, in Indian parlance, that is saregama padanisa, not do re mi. But anyway, now. <clears throat> He himself, in this last paragraph, is describing what um, uh, what is the situation where he fundamentally lives in in both worlds, both the finite and the in, in the infinite. He kind of straddles both, um, and uh, that is fairly unique in the. <clears throat> history of uh, other avatars and, you know, other godmen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, I wanted to see if people have anything they would like to discuss or ask or any whatever. I haven't heard this description I haven't heard this description of Samadhi before, mm. like in not in divine play, not in gospel. Mm -hmm. So, what do you mean? Well, it's much more detailed here than uh, I think than we get in. I also never heard Sri Ramakrishna be so clear about this whole process like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, well, this is this. This is very, very clear. It's very uh, unique that way, and I, I presume that Swami Doryananda had uh, probably gone over this several times uh, with Dan, uh, Dan Gopal Mukherjee before he wrote it, um, before he wrote it down. But Dan Gopal Mukherjee was also he was very avid about spiritual practice himself um, uh, after being turned on to it. <laughs> so uh, it is still available. I was surprised. I thought that it was out of print, but it is not. Um, there was a copy in the bookstore, and she can probably get others. Uh, but I'm kind of, you know, the face of silence. The face of silence. It's yeah. It's been. It's probably in the umpteenth edition by now or something. But it. No 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 no. This is Don Gopal Mukherjee. It has nothing to do with Nikhilananda. This is a whole different. This is a whole different thing. Um, this fellow. If this was published in 1926, he was probably gathering this, the information for this from, a, I don't know, maybe 1920 or something. You know, so a lot of the direct disciples uh, were still there. Um, Well, that's why Ramakrishna had a hard time describing it. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's. I find it wonderful that uh, the last gate, the last part of the, the plan that he describes, actually, he doesn't say anything about it. He just says that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just says it's to go from six to seven. It's pretty easy, <laughs> and that's about it. You know, uh, exactly. What happens that he doesn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, I just he decided to uh, use the word va valleys and stuff like that. Actually, you find in um, 
uh, in Islam, they refer to it as valleys. And I think in some of the uh, Christian stuff they do as well. And that's maybe why he, he pulled that. He thought maybe a Western readership would um, uh, identify more with the, the usage of the word as valleys than uh, plains or chakras. You know. Yeah. Well, as you can see, I mean, he was very Western educated and, and uh, three out of four of his, the people he dedicated it to were Westerners, so. <clears throat> uh, anything else? Okay, um, then I wanna go to, this is more about his experience. Hmm? Sorry? I was going to ask you. Yes? An author, is a Ramakrishna, he was born after Ramakrishna died. I don't know when he was born. Probably, yes. Yes, probably afterwards, yes. But Mataji, can you repeat his question for the online folks? Oh, he asked uh, when uh, John Gopal Mukherjee was born, was it uh, after Ramakrishna died? And yes, he, it, it probably was. Uh, so. Yes, he did. He did, ultimately. I, you know, as far as I know, he, he, he was possessed of this idea to to realize God, and he wasn't getting there as fast as he want, you know, as much as he wanted to, and somehow I think he misconstrued something or something, you know, or something, and then um, just, you know, yeah, did himself in. As much as I can imagine, he was so close to. Mm. Realizing, meaning he had tried. I would like to think that he got some healing in the process. Well, well, do you remember that um, in the gospel, or maybe, or maybe it's uh, the great master? I can't remember which. Uh, there's a young man who who used to come to him to, to Ramakrishna who was very highly evolved and he also he committed suicide and people came to the master and said what's you know what's with this and the master said he he accomplished everything he did so i'm i'm kind of wondering i mean i don't know about dangopal mukherjee's situation i have a feeling he was very um high strung his whole life but he uh he reportedly did commit suicide Situation, why was he not healing? Yes, who can say? I mean, that was a long time ago. That was a hundred years ago. I like to believe that that's what, that I, I, have a, I have a feeling that it, it, having come into the orbit of Rama, uh, Ramakrishna, that, um, you know, maybe if he went off his head a little bit or something like that, or uh, that it's still. He was he was still within the orbit of Ramakrishna, and he was still probably, uh, shall we say, in a spiritual sense, um, had accomplished you know a good deal and was in good hands, <laughs> uh, even though he was he got to sort of an utter extremity. Well, you know, Ramakrishna himself took down the sword of Kali and was going to cut his own throat with it at, at one point. I mean. What if the story had ended there? <laughs> you know, what if he had just like that was it? Would we ever be reading any of these? You know, it didn't happen in his case, but in Don Gopal Mukherjee's case, um, that was as far as his life was going to go. So the, the question is that uh, uh, this boy he he committed suicide, and Sri Ramakrishna is talking about, it. and also Sri Ramakrishna himself also killed. His own self. Well, he tried. He was going to. He was yeah. going to. But, but so the mother interfered. Yes. So now, how can a person know that uh, trying to kill himself, herself, 
is an act of that consciousness of that supreme realization, or is act of just let me disengage from the play, from the trouble. I don't think people can know that, which is why there is a certain a, a taboo against uh, against uh, doing that because. You can only work things out in the body. You can only work through whatever it is that you have to work through as long as you have a body mind. If you don't have a body mind, you're not able to progress. Okay, so the taboo is against ending things that way. But as Ramakrishna said, in some cases, you know, and, and, and we can't be from the outside, not, not having been there or... Uh, been a party to any of it, we can't really judge where people are are coming from. We feel, you know, sad that people, excuse me, come to the um, s situation of having to end their own lives. But we can't we can't judge. We don't know. Right. We need, that's what I think that uh, most of the teachers do say, we got to have a strong mind. It is not for the weak people to go to meditate. Right, right. You have to have a strong mind to meditate, correct. Um, but you never know. You might think you've got a pretty strong mind, and you might hit a, hit a rut, you know, and things kind of crash. It's really, it's really difficult to know. It's really it's difficult to know. The people online need to hear the questions. Too. Okay. So. Anyway, I, that that's the part I'm I'm uh, dwelling on more because in so close to Godhead principle in every way, why didn't he heal? Yeah, yeah. We don't know. Maybe he did heal. I mean, who knows? I, it's a hard to say. My po my point is that we need to be um, appreciative of the record that he left. Yes. And um, it's, a, uh, it's a, a really great contribution to the Ramakrishna yes. literature, yes. you know, yeah. Yeah, so, so my guess is um, in history of Indian spirituality for the last 2,000 years, like I have seen other lives too in South India and in Bengal, those who are worshiping mother or any other deity. In their life, they are saying, oh, Kartikeya, I'm just going to give up my life because I'm not seeing you. And at that time, the God, his chosen ideal comes and saves him. Mm. So it has happened over and over again. Mm. And in, in spiritual practice, it has happened. And some people like Bengali singer Pannalal Bhattacharya, is a very good uh, uh, devotional singer. He also committed suicide in Wikipedia. But I think it's also the same case, right? Mother, if you don't give me the vision, I will die, something mm. like that. So mm. it's not necessarily, oh, I'm just depressed because, you know, for some worldly reason and I can't carry on anymore. But it's more of, from that tradition we have to see. It's not right. a weakness of mind, but it's more of taking the chance. Let's see what happens. Yeah, so, so it, it's and it, it can be. I mean, I think he was a very high-strung personality. Yes, and and so uh, you know, it, it goes back to a person's temperament. You know, the cool-headed, but then the cool, cool, cool-headed generally probably become yanis anyway. They're not that devotional, so it's hard to really say. Um, but you're right. There's a whole tradition like this, um, and just as there are. Uh, lots of different kinds of practices, uh, which in the in the East are uh, quite different from in the West, but but common enough that they're acceptable within that context. Um, so, uh, anything else? Okay, let me go to the end um, of the. The, uh, the last chapter is called Last Impression.
So he's leaving, he's been spending some time with the monks at Belur, and, and he's leaving. <clears throat> As we rode across the river, the gray temple towers and the decaying trees of Dakshinishwar sank out of sight, and like a banner on the other shore rose the white turret of the monastery temple. The palms spread their fans in the air on which the afternoon sun shone fiercely. Now, excuse me, but the white turret of the monastery temple would have to be Holy Mother's temple because there was no big temple at Belur at that time. Now we saw ochre-robed figures moving about through green gardens. Turret by turret, roof by roof, the yellow-walled monastery came into full view and slowly vanished again as we made our boat fast under the stone embankment. Leaping over, I ran up the steps of the ghat like a happy squirrel. The life and vigor of the place possessed me at once. Oh, okay, he's coming to Belor. I ran along the wall of the first building and suddenly beheld the pundit sitting on the red tiled terrace waiting for me. Now this person he's referring to as the pundit here is M, I'm sure of it. Uh, the, the writer of the Gospel of Ramakrishna. After I had seated myself near him, I looked at his bearded face, then said, Sir, I leave on the morrow. He put his fingers through his white beard a few times, then remarked, Are the Ramakrishna legends that you have gathered tall enough? The legends ought to measure up to his sky-humbling stature. I said, no, they are not tall. They seem to be, to me, quite natural and normal. They are mostly based on reality. I do not mean that, he rejoined, bringing his lion head of a face close to mine. I mean, whatever legend grows up about him will become true. I do not understand you. I was puzzled. It is simple enough, the pundit ejaculated with a backward movement of his head. Look at Christ. Even his birth without any earthly father became a reality. Why? Because his being was so living and so tall that in order to explain him, they had to invent immaculate conception. The same was the case with Buddha. He was so divine that they had to invent the same origin for him, an immaculate conception, in order to grasp his essence. All legends become history when their central character is spiritual enough to sustain and give life to them. The story of the Immaculate Conception came after Buddha and Christ had become God, I repeated to myself. The pundit said, yes, the same thing is happening to Ramakrishna. He was so spiritual that in order to explain him, people have to resort to many supernatural explanations. It has been my lot to chronicle only his discourses. I wish it were my lot to chronicle the legends, I remarked. Unfortunately, what people tell me is more or less embedded in facts. Someday I will find those who will tell me of the supernatural higher legends. But not to change the subject, I should like to ask you, sir, is there any reason why all of you allow the property at Dakshineshwar to fall into ruin while you take good care of this place, which was built years after Ramakrishna's death. There is no reason, he answered without the slightest delay. You see how strong the trees look here, how fine the turf, and how healthy the cows, not to speak of the holy men. But this is where Ramakrishna lives. Wherever a few of the servants of truth dwell, being precipitates itself. And where there is being, life grows. All that you see here is a reflection of being. Then, that is true of all the disciples and followers of Ramakrishna, I commented. Who can deny it, he ex explained. When the master died, we had no place to go. Now, Benares, Kankal, Bombay, Bangalore, Madras, and dozens of other cities in India, and those that are abroad, 
have their Ramakrishna ashrama where men and women gather irrespective of religion and race to live so that a deathless being is precipitated. It has come faster than I dreamt, but such is the power of the inner life that the Holy One lives. We who lived with him know that his light is steeper than all darkness and will be shed upon the world as long as we can create it through living. It can grow wherever men choose to dwell in purity, holiness, and infinite tolerance. Why have they not chosen to live in Dakshineshwar, I asked again. He looked at me with those topaz eyes of his. It was uncomfortable to be gazed at, so apparently he felt my discomfort. So averting his gaze, he said, I cannot perceive the reason why you should identify the inner Dakshineshwar with the outer. Ramakrishna lives in the inner, which is in every soul. Wherever that soul goes, it goes with him. It is homeless in time, and it is homeless in space. Then a hundred years from now, no pilgrims will flock to that place across where he toiled and triumph, triumphed, I demanded his opinion. But, mon, but men must make pilgrimage to the sanctities within them. Why should they go to a place without? This is M's response. I hope no one will cheapen and exploit that place, Dakshineshwar. Ramakrishna has left nothing there that can in the slightest serve as a pretext for starting a new cult with its horrors of priestcraft and terrors of commercialism. Then you two are against history, I criticized him. The pundit said, Ramakrishna was a galloping torch that came to earth to light other torches, souls of men and women, so that each one of them would become God. He wanted every one of us to find not a religion, but to be religion. He set us that example. No priest, no rabbi, no padre. It is very difficult for an average man to give up all of that to find God within himself. This last remark was from Mukherjee. To that remark of mine, he answered, but those mendicants, priests, do not make religion. It is men and women who long for God and make him. Ramakrishna said so, and it is true of our time. This is a new age. It is the high noon of freedom and equality. Men are not surrendering their uniqueness of soul and intelligence to other men. On the contrary, they are asserting with tumultuous pride that each one of them is a son of God. If that is so in the outer life of man, how much more so must it be in the inner realm? Men do not wish to bend the knee any more to avatars and masters. They themselves would be the avatars. Every soul is golden wombed. Can you imagine? Every, now we have avatars. <laughs> We have movies, avatar, we have avatars on games, and you know, yeah, everything is an avatar. <clears throat> they themselves would be the avatars. Every soul, I mean, this is like prescient, you know? He, he's, he's predicting this. Every soul is golden wombed. It must give birth to God, the timeless. That you cannot bring about, that you cannot bring about by preserving Dakshineshwar, Kapilavastu, and Bethlehem. What have places or creeds to do with the purity of that being that men pour into this world through the realization of their inner life? Wherever men and women flock to kindle and quicken their souls, there incarnates the truth of Ramakrishna. A strange light came into the pundit's eyes. It was like tears, so full and so tangible. But now the afternoon was far spent. The opposite shore, Dakshineshwar, sank into deepening purple dusk. The boats loosed their sails that had been gleaming like sunset clouds of amber, amethyst, and rose. They slowly drifted shorewards, and in a few minutes, about a dozen of them were moored at the monastery gate. Got. There, then, their half-naked boatmen, like brown tritons, trooped up the steps with baskets of fruit, flowers, and rice to offer to the monks 
as Dakshina presents. They left their offering at the door of a hut, then walked toward the inner shrine in order to attend Arati. Swiftly, the day was passing into the night. Silence, like a black panther, began to prowl about us. We felt beset with sanctities. The pundit said to me, do you meditate or do you go hence now? I go, sir, I answered, to begin my story. This evening I do not meditate. He blessed me, then added, I must go and pray. May your soul pour compassion upon all. Farewell. In a minute he was gone. As I slowly went down the steps of the ghat, the sound of the gong smote the air. I listened as I sat still on my boat. Soon the chant came of many voices. I knew what they were saying, so I chanted, O thou river of miracles that is within me, pour the healing waters of compassion on the wounded body of man and make him whole. Now that I had hymned silence, we rowed our boat toward Calcutta. As we drifted down the tide, my imagination wandered back to the inner shrine of the monastery. I imagined myself sitting within, still attending Arati. With my mind's eyes, I saw those innumerable lamps lift their fragrant flames toward the image of Ramakrishna on the altar. The yellow-robed monk waved lit candles before it while I sat outside and sang again and again, O River of Miracles. By the time we had reached the Calcutta side of the Ganges, it was starry night. The blue-black sky vaulted above, haughty with aloofness, and the stars hung so low that they seemed intimate. Far off in the west, the lamps of the various monastery buildings and of the boats below were being lighted one by one. What did it all mean? Shall I ever be able to tell even a fraction of the joy and peace that was vouchsafed to me by those ochre-robed monks? Is it possible that men can live such a vivid life that it becomes a galloping torch of truth which the material darkness of our time cannot obscure? What had I witnessed? Did I dream these days over there in the monastery? Or did I truly live as I had never lived before? Cogitating in the above manner, I reached home. Can words translate for the reader, tut, that, which burns in the eyes of those monks across the river? Can anything in any language render the militant peace of the soul that men have won for themselves and for the world they live in? And is there anywhere in any age one single metaphor or a symbol which adequately conveys the meaning of that? Holiness alone can explain holiness and only insofar as we ourselves become sons of immortality shall we be able to understand those sons of God who have sought to help mankind. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Pada Padme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mahur Muhu Sri Ramakrishna Panam Astu Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace.